Good morning. Welcome to the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. I am Ken Pollack. I am a senior fellow of the Saban Center. And uh, welcome on this uh, very solemn anniversary. We're here today to deal with another topic of immense importance to America's national security, uh, one very different from the anniversary uh, that we're celebrating, but one that obviously portends to have a similar impact if it goes the wrong way. And of course, one of the great issues that we're wrestling with is exactly what does it mean for it to go the wrong way? What constitutes the wrong way? Here in the United States and in the Middle East, there is enormous debate over how to handle Iran's pursuit of a nuclear enrichment capability, a capability which would give Iran the ability to manufacture nuclear weapons if it chose to do so. And obviously, this is an issue that's been with us for a very long time. Uh, I remember I first encountered it in the immediate aftermath of the Gulf War in 1991, when Israel purchased 25 long-range F-15E strike fighters. And uh, those fighters were designated not F-15Es, but F-15Is. And the manufacturer said that the I was for Israel. But if you spoke to Israeli Air Force pilots and uh, commanders, what they uniformly would say to you is, no, 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 the I is for Iran. This is an issue, this is a problem, it is a threat that the Israelis have been thinking about for a very long time. They've spent a great deal of effort trying to figure out how to develop a military option to disarm Iran, to destroy its nuclear program if they ever chose to do so. And they have been working very assiduously at that. But by the same token, you will have noticed that while this has been a topic of active conversation, uh, in some senses going all the way back to 1991, at the very least since 2002, Israel has not yet exercised that option. And it has not done so for good reason. There are all kinds of good reasons not to strike and all kinds of bad reasons involved in a strike. And this has created a conundrum for Israel and it has created a conundrum for Israel's allies in the region and out. And it is why to this day, as Iran continues to move forward in defiance of United Nations Security Council resolutions, Israelis and their friends, first among them the United States of America, continues to debate what the right course of action is. Today, we are absolutely delighted to have with us Lieutenant General Danny Halutz. Uh, General Halutz, I believe, is well known to most in this audience. You have his full bio in front of you. Um, I will simply point out that after a long career in the Israeli Air Force, General Halutz rose to be the Chief of Staff, first of the IAF, and then later of the IDF, the Israeli Air Force, and then the Israeli Defense Forces. And in those two jobs, he served as two of the senior most Israeli military officers responsible for making decisions related to things like a strike on Iran. For that reason, his experience makes him uniquely qualified to offer insights into this issue. And we are absolutely delighted to have General Lutz with us today. I'd like to start by welcoming General Halutz to the podium. He'll make some remarks, then he and I will have a bit of a conversation, and then we'll open things up to all of you. Let me, before, before I do that, though, let me just ask everyone to please uh, set your phasers to stun. Uh, please turn your cell phones off, or at least to silence, uh, so that we can have a good conversation and everyone can hear what General Halutz has to say. General, please, the floor is Thank yours. You. I have to shut my phone as well. Well, uh, first of all, uh, 11 years ago, uh, we woke up to a new era uh, after the very tragic terror attack on the twins in New York. And uh, I think that the world was completely changed since then. And uh, the major goal of every one of us is to try and do the maximum in order to prevent such events from happening again. So all the sympathy to the families and to the victims of this great nation. Well, few remarks about uh, 
the hot potato. First of all, the I is for independence. Uh, independence in all aspects, even to take decisions. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that uh, the most bothering thing, in my view, that the Iranian case became a political issue instead of stay as a pure security defense issue that should be addressed regardless of your political view. And if such a thing, I think the most, first, most interesting issue at the top of the news, at the top of the concerns of many nations, becomes a question of Likud or a Labour Party or Democrats and Republicans, I'm bothered in a way. It means that if someone is going to be elected, he is not going to do anything or he's going to do nothing about it. And if other one will be elected, he will do everything. So it's not about everything and not about nothing. It's about doing the right thing. And what is the right thing to do? That's the question. I think that too much was said publicly and uh, the discussion over the Iranian case exposed too much of the operational abilities, plans, not to the details, but they gave a very uh, general description of what can be done, what should be done, etc., etc. And in a way, it's a kind of irresponsibility of those who spoke so much about it. And I'm not going to address none of those issues. Not about airplanes, not about bombs, not about penetration, not about, about anything. I think that uh, in this forum and in many other forums, beside the forums behind closed doors, we have to keep our mouths shut a little bit and uh, to deal with the strategic points of this problem. The alliance with U.S. is the most important and strategic asset to Israel, and that we have to keep in mind. And I think while saying it, that any decision, if and when it will be taken, should take into consideration this top priority thing of keeping the alliance with the U.S. strong and reliable. Reliable takes me to the most interesting problem that I see, that reliability is not the strongest point between the sides right now. Each one is suspecting the other side, each side is suspecting the other side that he's not putting all the cards on the table and uh, doing things behind the back, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think that we have to rebuild the understanding uh, between the side, uh, to rebuild in order to enable us all to get to the right decision on the right timing. And it's all about timing, because we have two scales, the Israeli scale and the American scale. And those two scales are not meeting for the time being, unless one watch will stop, and then the other one will reach the same time. But so far, as long as both of them are rolling in different speed, uh, there is a big argument about the timetable or the time left to take the right things or the right measures vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian case. I think that the policy based on three phases, three phases, diplomacy, sanctions, and use of force is the right policy. The question if we are doing it in a row or we are doing some of it in parallel. Uh, in order to save time, we should do some things in parallel and not to do it in a row. And more than that, we have to elaborate a, li a little bit. What is diplomacy? What is sanctions? To what extent? We can see the Canadian example about diplomacy in, we can see some other examples about diplomacy. What is the right diplomacy? 
I think that the right diplomacy is, first of all, to isolate the one you want to use those means against him. And international isolation is the most important thing, and it followed by sanctions, and sanctions should impact, first of all, the regime. Because we have nothing against the Iranian people. By saying we, I think that I'm covering everyone. Not against the Iranian people. I remember myself in 1972, spending two weeks together with Iranian pilots in Tehran uh, using F-4 simulator, because the Iranian was the only one then that had the money to buy the most expensive simulator that the Americans produced. So we were sent there to have some training. And I found that there are human beings like us, very well educated, very polite, smart people, and want to live. And the rest come from my father, who is from Iranian origin, and uh, he told me the stories about his background in this country. Unfortunately, nowadays, we can't visit there, but I hope that in the future we'll be able. Anyhow, sanctions. Diplomacy, sanctions, and use of force. Use of force is not just saying that the stick should be on the table. That's a very nice slogan, but we have to give it more 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 uh, explanation. What do we mean when we are saying stick on the table? Uh, absolutely, it should be the last, 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 last option, in my view. And never use force before you must use force. But when it comes to the use of force, you should be prepared. And I think that the use of stick or put the stick on the table has some uh, real activities that can be done before using the force. For example, force projection, exercises, training, uh, together with others, just to show that each one is backing the other. Uh, I think that reducing the volume or the size of the uh, exercise between the Israeli forces and the American forces is an indication of the wrong direction. Uh, instead of increasing the volume, to decrease it. And it's training, nothing but training. Uh, force projection, I don't have to explain here what is the meaning, but someone on the other side should see visually through the media and by other means that we mean business. Because I can't see how you can convince the Iranians only through diplomacy to come to the table, negotiate, and agree on something. The coffee in Vienna is a great coffee. But meeting in Vienna every month to drink coffee doesn't bring solution to the problem. Uh, we have to find other ways. And other ways, a combination of Diplomacy, strong diplomacy, and diplomacy is not related only to the Iranians. When we are speaking diplomacy, we have to build the front, the relevant front. And the relevant front includes China, includes Russia, includes India, includes many other forces which have meaningful weight on the decision-making process. It's not, um, it's not a problem of... U.S. and Israel, it's a problem of the entire world because the Iranian case is not Israeli case, it's not American case, it's not Saudi Arabia case. It's Middle East, it's Europe, and it's the entire Western community, free society. All those who are interested in free society should be interested in preventing the Iranian from having nuclear weapon. Because once they're going to have it, it will open a nuclear weapon race in the Middle East, in my view. 
then the Turks will follow, and the Egyptians will follow, and the Saudis will follow. No one will leave them alone in this region to be the regional superpower with a power. No one. And we have to ask ourselves if that's what we want to achieve. My answer, of course, is negative. No, we don't want it. Red line policy. I think that uh, red lines are red at the moment that you are drawing them. But when you come to the, take the decision according to the red lines, you may find out that the color is not red anymore. It can be black, it can be green, it can be blue, because situation is changing. We are living in a very dynamic world, very dynamic. Every morning, new news. And you cannot be stick to a decision that was taken on a specific time and act accordingly later on. Because you have to re-judge all the factors, all the facts, all the ingredients, all the elements, and come to a decision, real-time decision, that shows that you're addressing the real-time problem and not a problem that you faced a few months ago, a few years ago. More than that, I think that uh, giving lines, enabling the other side to bypass the lines in a way. So don't draw them lines in order to enable them to know exactly where are the borders. No, keep some uncertainty. And uncertainty is confusing the other side. It's not confusing yourself. If you are taking a decision to keep some uncertainty, leave the confusion to the other side. We must create a decision-making process that will integrate the interest of all participants. You know, in this case, I'm, I envy the, the Vatican, how they are electing the new pop. They are sitting in the room, nothing supplied to them until the white smoke is coming out of the window. So I'm looking for those windows and for the white smoke of those organizations, nations, people who should sit together Agree upon the facts, first of all. Agree upon the facts. And once agreeing upon the facts, then agree upon the decision. But as long as we don't agree upon the facts, no doubt that we'll find ourselves with a big gap regarding the decision uh, that should be taken. I uh, wrote down what are the issues that we agree upon. We agree upon that nuclear Iran is unacceptable. We agree upon that the Iranians are still moving on with their program. That nuclear Iran will enhance other Middle East countries to enter into this race. We agree that diplomacy and sanctions first. We didn't agree yet, and I'll come to it, what is the meaning of sanctions? And we agree that use of force should be prepared, displayed, but not used, but as the last resort. Last, 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 last. Many lasts should be added before using the force. Because using the force is not promising anyone that it will end forever the Iranian uh, nuclear program. Depends, of course, on the achievements, and I'm not going to enter into it, but I want to say one thing which is very important to all decision makers. Never underestimate the Israeli capabilities. With I, without I, uh, I think that Israel is a strong country with a lot of uh, options and capabilities. On what we are not agreeing so far, 
on timetable first who should do it and how to handle the decision making process those are the three elements in my view which are the most important to agree about timetable that's a challenge who should do it i think we should put it aside for the time being and how to handle the decision making process which is very important who are the participants and i believe that the participants around this virtual table should be more than israelis and americans because as as much partners as can be recruited to this job to this mission as better the results will be uh, will be from all aspects from the direct results but from the international results and the and, and the pr results or the how it looks to the world the such thing happened i will stop now with the 15 minutes you gave me <laughs> and uh, to join you please thank you Thank you, General. I think, you've, I think you've set the stage nicely. Um, there were a number of points that I wanted to pick up upon before we open it up to the questions from the audience. And the first one was this. You said force should only be the last, 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 last resort. I think I got all the lasts in yeah, there. About Someone five, can correct yeah. <laughs> me if, if I missed the last. Um, but you also said that the, the talks so far are not producing anything useful, just a lot of people drinking good Viennese coffee. So there's a gap that you've pointed out. What needs to go into that gap? What more would you like to see the United States, the international community doing to produce perhaps the better negotiations that you seem to have in mind? What is it that we're not doing now that we ought to be to fill that gap? Well, uh, I believe, first of all, that diplomacy and sanctions are connected in a way. First of all, in order to uh, have uh, more effective sanctions, you have to recruit more partners to impose sanctions. So far, when the Iranians are trying to export their oil and our buyers, we have to look who are the, those buyers and maybe to convince them to buy the oil from different resources or other resources and to buy them into the treaty that should impose sanctions. That's first. Second, sanctions. What are sanctions? You know, two days ago, it was mentioned that the uh, Iranian currency was dropped by 8% compared to the dollar. And I ask myself, how many Iranians are keeping tons of dollars in their safes that they are bothered from the 8% collapse of the real. Very few. Those who are concerned, by the way, are the Minister of Treasury there, the Minister of Finance, uh, Khamenei, etc. But the average regular Iranian is looking for his family, how to feed them, and we have to bring the Iranian to the dilemma of bread or nuclear. Then, to this point, without starving anyone, of course, uh, we have to do it in the most delicate and humanitarian way. But unless we'll bring them to this dilemma, the leadership, because once you bring them to this dilemma, then you'll see that the people are saying something. So far, the people are saying nothing in Iran. So we have to motivate the people to look around them and to see what's going on with them, because the regime decided to go on with a project which is unacceptable to the world. Sanctions are not only oil and materials for weapon, uh, for nuclear weapon. Sanctions, there is a list, long list, thousands of items that can be added to the sanctions list. Uh, I don't want to mention now, I don't want to uh, go through this list, but I'll mention one thing, okay? For example, uh, the Iranian airlines, if they are continuing to fly to the Western countries, which are part of the, 
of the negotiation in Vienna, okay, do something about it. Iranian ships which are shipping across the oceans on the flags of unexisting countries, uh, or existing countries, mm -hmm. but unknown countries. Uh, that's something that can be done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and uh, the list is long. The list is impacting a lot of the Iranian population, and that's the problem. That's a dilemma. Because if I would have known of a specific thing which are pinpoint. The, the regime itself, and only, it, will, it would have been the best. But mm. such a list doesn't exist. Uh, we have to be more sharp with the sanctions. And, as I said, together with diplomacy, the diplomacy has two, f two different phases. One is the countries that already agreed, like Canada, and did what it did. How many will join? That's first. Second is to collect other forces which are not part so far to be part of it. And I'm addressing mainly the three leading countries and some in South America as well. Uh, I would like to see Brazil there, to see Russia, to see China, to see India, etc., etc. The leader of the world economy be part of sanctions, because if the leaders are not going to be part of it, the sanctions will take time to be effective. It will take a lot of time. There's a, another uh, idea out there. It's, it's more than an idea, it's a reality. Um, you, know, you may have noticed, General, that someone seems to be killing a lot of Iranian scientists, and a lot of Iranian computers seem to be malfunctioning. And uh, there are a lot of people who seem to believe that there are some countries out there that are deliberately doing this. Um, it was mentioned somewhere? People have all of these wild conspiracy theories, as you know, in the Middle East. Um, but let's take this as an idea. Um, you know, there's a debate related to these covert operations, whether they make war less likely by creating an alternative source of pressure on the regime. That's one argument. Another argument is that it's the kind of thing that could provoke the Iranian regime and start an unintended clash. What's your feeling about whether or not this is a useful way to, to try to close that gap that, uh, that you were describing? Uh, first of all, I think that uh, the underworld campaign uh, is part of the campaign. And it's not a secret that the Iranians are already 10 years two years ahead of nuclear bomb. Uh, and the delay was achieved according to some activities that were done by, I don't know whom, uh, and it was so far successful. But there is an end to, to the, this success. In the end of the day, the Iranian students who are attending the Western universities in high quantities will be well educated how to develop methods and mm -hmm. systems to prevent it. That's another area of sanctions. <laughs> uh, I will never offer to anyone to pinpoint any leader that was elected by his people and to see him as a target in order to, I will not offer it, because then we are opening a new game. Mm. And in this game, there are many players. And I don't think that uh, in our world, we should look at it as a trivial solution to pinpoint the leaders and the uh, unless they are doing something which is strongly against the international law. Yeah. In this case, we have the option, we can do it, but we have to prove it. Uh, 
Other, otherwise, we are leaving it to the interpretation of individuals or, uh, or uh, countries, etc. And uh, you know, you may find opponent to any leader in the world. In the world, right. Right. so let's stay within within the limits, within the cultural limits that we have been raised upon. Let me, if I may, move back to this, this narrower question of the use of force. You didn't rule it out. You put it at the very end of the spectrum, but you didn't rule it out. And uh, you've made clear your views on red lines. I think that that makes eminent good sense. Uh, anyone who's been in these kind of positions knows that uh, what looks very clear at one moment in time can look very, very blurry at another point. But I would like you to, to kind of help an American audience understand a bit better how an Israeli leadership might think about when you've reached that last, 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 last resort. So without going into any specifics, I mean, obviously at some level, this is a matter of cost-benefit analysis. When does the benefit outweigh the cost and risks of the operation? So give us, if you could, some sense of uh, events out there, things that could happen that would shift that calculus to the extent where you think that a conversation about the use of force would be warranted. In other words, if you were back in your job as IDF chief of staff, when would you go to the prime minister and say, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, not we have to strike. I don't think you'd ever say that. But you know what, Mr. Prime Minister, now is a moment when we ought to have a conversation about whether our current course continues to make sense or whether we need to shift to a different course because of something that happened. Well, first of all, when I say last, 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 it has nothing to do with timetable. Last, last, last is uh, 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 represent mainly the level of effort that was done in each area. If we came within a week, we'll finish with all the diplomacy efforts successfully. Okay, then, and in parallel to it, the sanctions are very effective and nothing achieved. Maybe in two weeks, we'll come to the decision. Last, last does mean that you are maximizing the efforts in the other areas. In parallel to it, you are building the force. You are building the abilities, not just saying it. Saying is not enough. And I'm sure, by the way, that all those involved have the plans. And I'm sure, because otherwise they are not, they are not paying their salary. Uh, regarding the second part of the question, uh, I think that any answer I'll give would be too much. Uh, when will be the point that I will go to if I was in? Uh, I would say that the basic problem right now is the past experience of the different organizations which are taking care of the information to be provided to the leaders in order to take decision. You know, in the US, you have the, the memory of Saddam with the unconventional weapon. So I assume that they will come and say, there is a green light only when they would be sure in 100%. But there is no 100%. And uh, in the Israeli case, maybe it's different. So, but in Israel, it's our case. And I, I'm sure that no 100% is needed. 100%. 99 is enough, OK? And, uh, and I'm speaking without knowing what's going on now with, in those establishments. But I assume, as a human being, that once an organization gave information that led into operation, and the information was found to be not the most accurate one, it create, it put a kind of uh, hesitation on next time. Uh, so generally speaking, 
when the feeling is that the sword is on the throat, that's the time. Uh, but there is no one formula mm -hmm. to define what is sword on the throat, and that's a problem. This point about the formula, though, um, let me see if I can push you a little bit on that. We talk about, whenever we think about threat, we talk about capabilities and intentions. Yeah. When you think about Iran, and you think about that last resort, which side do you weight one side or the other more heavily? Is it the intentions that are more troubling to you, the capabilities? And again, this gets back to my previous question of which might cause Israel to shift and decide, you know, what we need to move ahead. Is it more something related to Iran's capabilities or more re something related to Iranian intentions? Well, it's the combination. Uh, the problem is the, com the current combination. If the combination will change in the future, it's a new ballgame. Right now, the combination that we have a very extremist regime with very extreme declarations, statements, etc., vis-à-vis Israel and vis-à-vis -vis others, by the way. Uh, but for the others, they are not claiming for elimination. Uh, the only eliminated one uh, for the time being for the Iranians are Israel. They want to see us out of the map. Uh, so, extreme regime with weapon of mass destruction is a combination that very few are ready to live under such a combination. I'm not saying by that that the first thing in the morning after they will have, God forbidden, a nuclear weapon, they will wake up and uh, Ahmadini, Jihad, or Khamenei, will push the red button nearby the bed. No, uh, that's not the, I think it's too uh, dramatic. Uh, but I would say that uh, in different combination, a very stable regime, logical one, moderate one, such a weapon and it exists in some other places in the world. But we rely on the decision makers. We rely on the system. The problem is that we don't rely on the decision makers and the system there to take, to take the right decision in the right time. That's the problem. Uh, so we can change the regime. Or delay the project. I want to ask you two more questions. And the first one is a direct follow-on to what you just said. In some ways, it's a bit of an unfair question, but I do want to push you on this. The Iranians have announced they're going to have presidential elections on June 14th. Imagine two wildly different scenarios, neither of which I expect to happen. But again, just to kind of perhaps push your thinking a little bit to give us a better sense of, of how you're thinking about this. Imagine that on June 14th, Somehow, miraculously, Mohammad Khatami is re-elected president of Iran, and he announces that he, the, his first act is going to be a rapprochement with the international community to see the sanctions lifted by addressing the international community's fears about nuclear weapons. And the alternative, imagine on June 14th, Qasem Soleimani is elected president. And Qasem Soleimani announces that he will do everything in Iran's power to see uh, Iran protected. Uh, how did those two changes affect Iran, uh, Israel's calculus? First of all, the positive thing in this scenario is that till May we have time. <laughs> uh, that's first. But uh, let's go. Uh, option one, OK, I think that even and myself, I will vote for him if he's uh, going to do it. And you know, you I think have an Iranian background, chances? so the only passport that maybe <laughs> I can get is Iranian passport. Uh, option two uh, will speed up the need to take the aggressive measures. That's all. Uh, 
course, it should be carefully checked, carefully uh, assessed, etc., etc. You know, words that are said before election, in most of the cases, are not used afterwards. I still remember the, Ameri the American embassy in Jerusalem <laughs> for the last 45 minutes. I thought you were going minutes. to say yeah, that. <laughs> okay. So those are words, and uh, we have to give the words the, the whole respect, but limited respect uh, when they are used. When they are used for politics. Microphone, it's not, that's, that's his technology, not mine. Works. Dan, folks, if you can uh, up the level on General Halutz's microphone so that people can hear him better, we'd appreciate it. <coughs> Please continue. So uh, anyhow, I, I would say that uh, we, we have to be careful with, uh, with, the, with the publicity that done uh, before election in order to be elected and the deeds that someone will do after election. It's not always 100% correlated. Very good. Last question. Uh, isn't something a big one. It's, uh, it's an issue that I think we all here in Washington recognize as being related, uh, but we very rarely talk about it in terms of the actual relationship. Uh, and that's Syria and how it plays into this entire calculus. Obviously, uh, Syria is an enormous issue for Israel all by itself, but there is also a very important connection to the Iranian issue. And I was hoping, you know, given your extensive background, take us through a little bit how Israel is thinking, how the Israeli leadership is thinking about Syria, the, the threats, the opportunities there, and, and how it is related to this Iranian issue that we've been talking about. Well, uh, the chain of, uh, the, the known chain of Iran, Syria, uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, uh, is not a new one, and I believe that once the Syrian bloc is going to be taken from this wall, from this, uh, from this chain. Uh, it will influence dramatically over the Iranian strengths in the Middle East, uh, about their ability to use their proxy, the Hezbollah, uh, real time or by remote uh, whenever they want. Uh, it will change Hezbollah situation in Lebanon without having the big brother, the Syrian, supporting them uh, on a daily basis. All those, based on the assumption that the replacement to Assad is a completely different replacement, who knows? Uh, one thing should be said, that uh, Iran is the only Shia country in the world. And... Uh, Hezbollah is a Shia organization, but in a multi-religion uh, country uh, like Lebanon. And uh, as it looks now, most of those who are uh, protesting and fighting the, the Syrian regime are Sunnis. Uh, so in this respect, I believe that uh, if, it's not if, when the Syrian regime will be replaced, uh, we we'll see something new. It, it is going to be better, the same, or worse. In any case, it gives you at least 33% of chance uh, for better. Uh, and uh, I'm looking for this 33% as an option. And... Uh, it's high, high chance, by the way. There is no lottery with uh, 33%. Uh, anyhow, anyhow uh, no doubt it will, it, it, it's connected to the entire Iranian problem uh, because if they are going to lose their footstep in, uh, in, in uh, Syria and partially in Lebanon, I think that they w will reconsider their position. They will, I don't know if it will reflect onto the uh, nuclear, uh, it will reflect into the nuclear uh, program, but it will do something to the Iranian leadership 
and they will have to reshape their policy and their diplomacy. To what extent? God knows. Allah knows. Very good. All right. Let's open things up to the audience. Uh, if you'll raise your hands, um, I'm going to call on people. Uh, I'm going to call on people in, in pairs. Uh, actually, maybe we'll go with trios because I want to get there are a lot of hands up there, and I want to get a lot of people in. So we'll take three at a time. If everyone could identify their name and their affiliation, so General Halutz just knows uh, who you're from, and then please ask a question, a single question, and please make sure it is a question as opposed to a statement where you simply inflect your voice at the end as if it were a question. Okay, so I'll start right down here with Said. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, General Halutz, my name is Said Erekat uh, from Al Quds Daily Newspaper. Uh, my question to you, uh, General, it is alleged that the Iranian nuclear uh, program is spread over thousands of sites uh, across the country, that is three times the size of Iraq, uh, that would require a sustained bombing that will go on not for weeks but perhaps months. Does Israel have the capability to go that alone? Thank you, sir. Okay. We'll take right down here in front. Uh, my name is Hassan. I was born in Tehran. I'm very happy that uh, Persian Empire gave a free pass to your ancestors to come to Iran, and your grandfather or your father was from Iran. I'm very proud of From you. Shiraz. Shiraz. Oh, that's a land of love. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question is this, that we have 7 billion people in the world right now, the population since January. 2012, and uh, the Middle East or the portion of only maybe 300 million or very small portion of what the world population is. But how could we, as a kind of a minority uh, population, kind of form the uh, big events of the world if a war happens in that area, will affect 7 billion people? Could we not, all of us, be able to sit face to face and see what is hurting us or what is aching us and then come up to some kind of a solution which every human being is looking for, which is pursuit of happiness and freedom and providing for their children? Thank you. Okay, and we'll go right to the gentleman here in the, uh, the turquoise shirt. Mm -hmm. Thanks, my name is Mike Pasek. I represent the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. Um, my question, you were talking about the importance of mobilizing Iranian citizens against the regime, but we saw recently that that wasn't quite so effective in Iranian protests, and I'm wondering how you think citizens might actually be able to revolt against the government and if they could be successful this time. Okay. General, why don't we take some responses from you? Okay, the Iranian learned the lesson of the Iraqis. And, and yeah, Iran is a huge country, very nice country, uh, and uh, with a very interesting terrain. And uh, the Iranians are doing uh, all their efforts in order to spread their, pro their program and to, to uh, locate it in very uh, difficult places from the attacker point of view. Uh, I didn't speak about Israel. I spoke about use of force. And I say that one of the things that uh, use of force just in case, uh, remember, I'm, I'm not uh, pushing anyone to attack Iran today and even not tomorrow. Uh, use of force by all those who are interested in preventing Iran from having nuclear capability. I think that all those has the capability to do it. All those. Regarding face to face, yeah. Our face is ready. The question if the other faces are ready. Uh, to sit around the table and to discuss everything. Uh, you know, when you're coming into discussion, it's a give and take. The question is, what 
someone has to offer in order to give and what he want in order to take. And that's the, that's the problem. If the take is go away from the Middle East, for us, there is no reason to enter to the same room and sit around the table. If we want to discuss seriously, yeah. And uh, it's not a secret that uh, we were sitting and we are sitting with many of our neighbors around the table. And we had few achievements. We had peace agreement with Egypt. We, had, we signed peace agreement with Jordan. I hope that in the future, I hope it will be in the new future, the Palestinians will sit together with the Israelis and will be able to reach agreement. So things are going on. But in this case, I think that the gap with the Iranians is so big not because we had any direct conflict. Just to remind ourselves that 34 years ago, under the Shah, the relations between Israel and Iran were of the best in the, were the best in the Middle East. Okay? And we were, we were partnering many, many activities and many, many things. And if the wheel of history still works and it's still rotating, maybe the future will bring us better news. So far, it looks that the gap is huge. Uh, and uh, we need the intermediators. Regarding the <coughs> Iranian people, you know, that's something beyond my ex beyond my knowledge and beyond my expertise. We saw uh, last year, a year ago, a little over a year, that uh, Iranian opposition in Iran uh, tried, to, tried to do something. But it was too little, and uh, they didn't have enough energy to keep the momentum. And uh, I don't know what was, if at all, the external uh, assistant or help that they were get or they received, I don't know. No doubt that there are forces in Iran who are objecting the attitude of the current regime. I think that Iran, as I remember it, was on the way to be a more Western-oriented country, more open, liberal country. And everything was stopped very sharp in 78. Uh, I believe, but uh, I'm optimistic, I believe that the future will change it. But I don't know how, how much it will take. And uh, Ayatollah control of Iran is not a new phenomenon. It was in the past. <coughs> we see it now from 78, but if we'll go 200 years, 79. Yeah, if we'll go back to history of Iran, we'll see that it happened already in the past. Uh, that uh, clerks or religion people uh, controlled the country. So let's hope Shalom. for the Iranians. I'll start moving back. We'll go with Margaret. Margaret Warner from the PBS NewsHour. Uh, today, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, um, those, who, the, those who refuse to draw a red line to Iran don't have the moral right to put a red light to Israel. Why do you think he is uh, demanding publicly that, that President Obama set a red line to Iran? And are you saying you think that's a mistake? Okay, we'll take uh, Trudy behind her. Uh, Trudy Rubin, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, following on to Margaret's question, I'd like to ask you what your analysis is and what you think the predominant feeling is inside the Israeli security community about what is the real nature of the threat that Iran presents to Israel. The Prime Minister has put it in apocalyptic terms 
And of course, Iranian rhetoric makes it easy to adopt that position, but many Israeli security experts, as you know, believe that the real Iranian intent is to have breakout capacity and that they couldn't dare to hit Israel because A, they destroyed Jerusalem, Al-Quds, two million Palestinians, and ensure that part of their country was obliviated. So um, uh, how do you see that and do you think the predominant feeling among security experts within Israel tends one way or the other? Okay, and then Les, we'll take uh, Natan in the center there. Thanks, Natan Sachs from the Saban Center here. Um, in previous cases, both on the Iranian issue in the past decade and with other threats reportedly dealt with by Israel, we've never seen this kind of discord that we see in the past year. So what is it you think that has changed that we hear so many voices coming out of Israel discussing not only the politics and the decisions that were mentioned, the possible decisions, but also the security aspects of a uh, potential Israeli operation? What has changed from three years ago when the Iranian question was also paramount uh, in your experience? Three great questions. Uh, what changed? Three years. <laughs> three years, three years time, time was used. And, uh, and this time they made a progress. And uh, you know, what the Iranians are looking for in their policy of walking on the edge, that was a successful policy for the last 10 years, they gained 10 years of doing and doing and doing and doing. In the end, they will complete what they have in mind. So that's the reason why the voices or the volume is higher. If the right words are said, that's another story. Now, I'm not here to criticize my prime minister. And I'm saying it very loud and clear. He is my prime minister and his decision will impact me as others. And regardless if I vote for him or not, he's the Israeli prime minister. He was elected in a democratic way. And as long as he's sitting on his chair, he has the right to take the decisions and uh, to implement. No doubt that the Iranian case is very unique one. I said what I think about red lines. And if Brooking Institute will make a survey about red lines policy, you'll find out that in the world, there may be one example of red line that was successful. Maybe, even though, even in this case, I'm not sure. From the Israeli side, I say that twice we put a red line, <clears throat> and twice we failed with the red line. We put a red line to Lebanon when we first withdrew from Lebanon in 2000, and we didn't act accordingly. <clears throat> and we put a kind of red line when we withdrew from Gaza, the disengagement from Gaza. And we didn't act accordingly the day after, because red line is red when it's draw. The day after, the color is changed. And Red become pink, and pink become white, and white become red. Uh, I think that and as I said, I'm not criticizing my prime minister because he's my prime minister, and uh, but I'm criticizing red line policies. And I think that to come to the US, the elephant, and to ask him to put a red line to the ant is something not logic. And as the famous actor in the Republican uh, conference said, when you have to shoot, shoot. Don't talk. Don't put red lines if you have any intention. If you have intention, say it. Do, not say, do. I don't think that, uh, by the way, red lines can be said in closed rooms. In closed room, yeah. Call the other side and tell him, look, you know the balance of forces. You know 
what can happen if you are not going to do A, B, C, but in closed room? Because when things are done publicly, we are human beings. The fact that someone is a leader doesn't change his human characters. On the contrary, in some cases, it increases, increasing his human character. So, he's a human person. And uh, if you are drawing red lines in the Washington Post or in the NBC or CNN, the other side will be, first of all, insulted. Then he will react emotionally and not rationally. And we are looking at the brain of those people, not at the hearts of those people. All right, let's shift over. There's a question back. Is it James? I can, there's a gray arm raised, but I'm not quite certain who it belongs to. In the back there. Hi, James Kitfield from National Journal Magazine. Thanks for doing this. You mentioned that the, um, you were disappointed that the, um, the issue of U.S.-Israeli relations have got caught up in politics, and I think we've seen that in this election to a degree um, I can't remember seeing. And I'm curious whether uh, you think that um, the Israeli leadership, because we, we, we can blame our own politicians, but I'm curious whether you think the Israeli leadership um, has some blame in that. <clears throat> and do you worry that if this is allowed to go unchecked, that it will affect the, the nature and the character of our relationship. There's a hand to the right, too. Uh, let's try in the back. Is that Michael, maybe, who has a hand up? Okay. I, to Michael Adler from the Wilson Center, and thank you for coming. To follow up on that question, um, you spoke about the importance of the U.S.-Israeli alliance. Given this Iranian crisis, how, at what point would Israel step away from that? In other words, how much discord could there be if Israel felt it had to act and the United States was still saying, please don't act? And then the gentleman here in the pink. Thank you. Uh, Yevgen Satin, Jr. Fellow from Carnegie. And I was wondering if you could comment on the kind of slew of issues coming out in the publications that an Iranian strike could be a possible October surprise within the upcoming presidential elections here. An October surprise for the uh, American presidential elections. Bibi would have a little surprise for Barack. Okay. For Barack. Uh, regarding the uh, relation, yeah, I say it and I, um, I will say it again. The importance of uh, the relation the good relations between the American uh, people and the American administration to the Israeli people and Israeli administration is, is of the highest importance to Israel. Period. Now, I don't think that the blame should be put on one side only. Both sides took part in climbing too high and you know, as high as you climb, as hurt is the falling from the tree that you climbed on. Uh, there is a way to reduce the tension. And the way is like two mature people should sit together in the room, discuss it openly, uh, and uh, agree on what we agree, and disagree on what we disagree. Even in good relation, there are some disagreements, and disagreements are not canceling all the background, all the history, and all the good relations that do exist in other areas. Uh, we have to differ between uh, different, different uh, establishments, and I think that in some areas the relations are excellent. And in some areas, mainly at the political level, high political level, it suffers from <coughs> declaration and counter declaration that made here and there. Some of them are serving the internal politics of each country. Some of them are serving the case itself. 
uh, even though I think that the uh, mutual interest of all participants are stronger than the dispute between the sides, than the, uh, the gaps, small gaps or cracks that we have in the uh, wall of good relation. Uh, once again, I don't think that it worth the words of to be used to blame this side uh, in this percentage and this the other side in uh, the other percent of the, the whole hundred. Uh, one time, one side is carrying all the responsibility, and one time, the other side is carrying all the responsibility. And I think that both, both sides made mistakes and things that should have been said in closed rooms were said publicly and openly and strong, too strong. October, I don't know what kind of surprise someone would expect in October. My surprise in October, if my wife will ask me to go to a vacation. That's the only <laughs> surprise that I'm going to face. Uh, no other surprise to my knowledge. Uh, but you know, surprises are surprises even if you know that they're going to happen. Uh, my personal assessment, but it's, it's based on no, no real time information and not on the details. My feeling is that uh, no one is going to surprise no one in the near future. Uh, but it's a feeling, it's not a knowledge. Uh, feeling that based on knowing the systems and how decisions are taken and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But God knows. Okay. Yes. Take more questions. Uh, while we bring it down here, we'll take the gentleman right here in the blue. Hi, my name is Joe Guggenheim. I'm just an individual citizen. As you said, General, there are always some uh, little uh, disputes as to what the actual facts are with respect to the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, the U.S. government is saying that uh, everything that's been done so far by the Iranians is consistent with just peaceful uses, and they have not made any decision or taken any steps towards a nuclear weapon. In that regard, also, the uh, supreme leader, the Ayatollah, has said that it would be a fatwa for Iran to have a nuclear bomb and it would be a, a curse on or a sin for Muslims to, uh, to have a nuclear bomb. How do you evaluate that? How do you see the Israeli public evaluate that? And how do you think it might affect uh, negotiations? Okay, well, we give it to Sam right in front of you. That right, uh, Ambassador Lewis. Um, I'm Sam Lewis, General. I think we met a long time ago. Um, I admire your deft handling of the domestic political questions. They're very tricky right now, and I don't think it's... I agree with you totally. If we had only stopped talking about this issue, it would be a lot easier to deal with it. But that's not going to work in either country, so... Uh, let me ask you this question, though. Can you imagine, 10 years from now, after perhaps a war with Iran, perhaps not, a lot of other things we can't imagine right now, can you imagine Israel and the United States relationship having deteriorated to the point where we're still friends, we have links, but we no longer can in any sense be called allies. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell and I write the Mitchell Report and I want to raise a subject that may be slightly off topic and or that you may have covered uh, before I got here 30 minutes late thanks to having spent an hour and a half with tens of thousands of my best friends uh, commuting this morning. Um, and the question is this. It, it appears as though 
the um, near term and probably medium term uh, result of the Arab awakening, as it's called here, is that um, is the is that the Islamists will will become the primary players in politics in those countries surrounding you. My question is, uh, first from the Israeli perspective, and second uh, from the American perspective, um, do you view that as a, as a positive, a negative, or, or somewhere in between? I can't, Ambassador Lewis, I can't imagine in 10 years, I can't imagine, and it means that we, I'm talking about the Israeli side, Joe, could you speak up a little? I think have a lot to do about. And of course, uh, the American side as well, but I can't imagine because uh, by saying that, uh, in my view, it's a strategic asset, it's not only a, on the material side of it. Uh, so I don't want to think about such uh, development. And uh, if I'll be aware that we are taking our way to this direction, uh, I'll do everything possible to shift it back uh, to the right place because uh, it's very important uh, beyond, as I said, any material aspect of it. That's first. You know, the fact that uh, the Islamic world uh, contain right now 1.25 billion people. It's a fact. It's a known fact. And uh, we have to get used to it, and we have to find the golden path to live with this fact. Most of them, most of them want to live like us. Most of them. And we may find extremists among all of us. We don't have to go to Iran to find extremists. We can go to Oklahoma from time to time, or to uh, Jerusalem, or to the West Bank to find extremists. Uh, the problem is not with the uh, religion. The problem is with the ambitions of those uh, leadership of those countries. Some of them want to impose their belief on the rest of the world. Some of them. And we have to fight those. And I think that uh, there is a way, or I don't think that there is no way to live together in a peaceful way. Uh, you know, we are speaking about uh, uh, Muslims taking over. Uh, we have many examples out of the 50, I think it's 53 Muslim countries uh, worldwide. They are not one unity. They are sharing the same religion, but they are not one unity from different origin, from different culture. The Indonesian are one, the Malaysian are second, the Indians who are uh, Muslim, the Chinese are Muslim, the, the Uzbeks, and then, okay, there are many Christians are worldwide, but they are not one unity. Uh, they even have different languages, etc., etc. It's not frightening me. It's encouraging me to find the right ways how to deal with those different nations and to find the ways. From the Israeli perspective, we are facing a different thing. Because when religion and political ambitions are combined, 
that, that's created the problem for us. And uh, I, I will say now, and I, I will re-say it whenever I will be asked, Israel is not yet accepted in the Middle East. Is not yet accepted in the Middle East. And uh, that's the reason why we have to be strong. That's the reason why we have to fight any sign of changing the balances. That's the reason. Once we'll be accepted and embraced by our neighborhood, it will be a completely different story. Now, about the American standpoint regarding the Iranian, what they're doing with the nuclear, it's news for me. I know that even the American establishment knows that the Iranians have a nuclear military program in parallel to the other. That's first. And regarding fatwa, I really respect the Quran and I read it in order to know it. But there are fatwas and there are anti-fatwas or counter-fatwas. Depends who is the Qadi or who is the Ayatollah who wrote the fatwa. And uh, you can find fatwa and the contrary, another fatwa of another one. One is living in Egypt and one is living in Iran. And they are not fully correlated regarding the fatwas. The same with rabbis and we say, the same with uh, archbishops. They are writing, but I, I'm not sure that they are interneting uh, when they are writing it and uh, addressing it to the rest of the believers that will be able to react. So I don't rely on those fatwas. I rely on actions. When you see it, you can believe it. When you read it, it's not enough. OK, let's take four quick questions. And I'm going to ask for them to be brief. And I'm going to ask so that uh, we can get some brief answers and wrap things up at 11. We'll take Marvin first. Marvin Kalb, I'm a guest scholar here at Brookings. You have been asked the Iran question many, many times. I'm still not quite sure I understand the rhythm of your answers. Do you trust the United States to do the right thing? Yes. You do? OK. Uh, okay, there's a, a gentleman in a uh, beige shirt with a beard right there. We'll take him. He's been long-suffering. Thank you uh, for your speech. Uh, I'm from the Syrian Expatriates Organization. My name's Shomo, and my question is about Syria. You said how the fall of the Assad regime, which is probably happening, will be a major blow to Iran, but there's only a 33% chance that it will work in our favor. What would you say about increasing support to the opposition to increase the chance it would work in the favor of the U.S. and of Israel? Increasing, once again, about the last? Uh, increasing support for the opposition, especially armed support for the Syrian opposition. Okay. We'll take uh, the gentleman right here in the lavender shirt. Uh, my name is Alex Smith. I'm working for the Russian service of the Voice of America. and. Naturally, my question refers to the role of Russia. Uh, how would you characterize the motivation for the Russia's government uh, to block the resolutions? I mean, with this, the whole complex of facts, I mean, regarding uh, Iran and Syria. Thank you. Okay. And then the lady here in black, who has also been waiting very patiently. Thank you, um, General. My name is Jeanine Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Following his question, I'd like to ask, what do you see the role of China in your diplomacy and sanctions? Why don't we take some Brief answers on that. Wrap things up. Okay. Uh, I answered very short, and I said yes, uh, and I, I'm still with the yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I hear. But a one thing that I want to add to it because it was too short, and uh, I have to be polite to give some more. <laughs> uh, I said that yes, but uh, it shouldn't be done secretly. It should be discussed with the other side to 
build their confidence that this yes, as I believe, is a real one. That it should be discussed. It's not something that should be done behind closed doors. You have to rebuild the confidence of the Israelis, and I think it's a matter of confidence. That's all. But personally, I believe, yes, the American, I believe that what they are saying they are going to do, and they're going to implement. <laughs> Syria. Uh, you know, there is a big question. Who is, who is uh, uh, leading the Syrian uh, uh, revolution? There are many forces over there. Personally, I, I'm, not, I'm not recognizing a leader over there. There are groups, some of them are very extremist, which is regarding the 33% chance of each, they belong to the bad 33% because they are they were imported from, some of them from Afghanistan, some of them from Iraq, some of them. I don't know what they are preparing for everyone or for us. Uh, the old traditional opposition that mainly stayed in Europe, in France and in, 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 in England, I don't know where, uh, I don't know what their power and uh, because those to be equipped and supported by, by uh, the West, by the Americans, by the French, by I don't know, who, oh, are not the original opposition because they are the fighters. The, the original opposition, uh, I don't know if they are fighting. They are the foreign ministry of the revolution. Uh, So I have no recommendation in this respect. I don't think that uh, uh, direct involvement, direct involvement of the West will help to solve the situation. On the other hand, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, Turkey are involved in this uh, campaign. And I think that there, they can do the right job, and they know better who are the leading forces over there, and they can do better once they are uh, aligned with the uh, with the Western community, with the with Europe and with the U.S. Russia and China. Uh, I think that, from my point of view, there is no doubt that Russia and China has a major role. Uh, vis-a-vis -vis many things, but vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian case. And if the uh, Russian foreign minister is saying that sanction over Iran is harming the Russian economy, well, in this case, I lost my words. Uh, I don't know, I don't know uh, how it's harming the uh, Russian economy, but I take it as it was said. But I think that uh, Russia and China they are both they are superpowers economy-wise, and they have strong power in, on diplomacy and military. So they are the right combination to join the other forces if they believe, and I do think that they believe, that proliferation of weapon of mass destruction should be stopped. If that's the case, I can't understand why they are sitting on the fence, or from time to time they are sitting over the fence, one leg here and the other leg uh, on the other side. I would like to see the Russians and the Chinese more proactive in this respect, and I think that they are, in my view, they are the key, a kind of key element to convince the Iranians, because the relation between China and Iran and Russia and Iran are better than the relation between Israel and Iran and US and Iran. So I hope to see them in this campaign. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I enjoyed it. Okay. And, 
allow me to just say a word of thanks to our friends at J Street who made it possible for General Halutz to, to appear today and to thank General Halutz himself. This is an incredibly important moment and it is such a wonderful opportunity for Americans to have the benefit of your views, of your experience, and of your insights. So thank you very thank much, you. General. Thank you. Thank all of you.